everyone. We are live yet again. Let's see. Just trying to get everything situated. I have to always constantly now with the, the bigger dog move things around so he has room when he watches me uh, work on the computer. And I used to have a whole setup with like an ottoman in front of me and now all everything gets situated. So every time I have to reassess. But with that said, this is going to be one of my author chats of the week, and I just have to keep my eye out for my co-host. It's going to be her first time doing one of these um, lives, I mean, uh, co-live. Co so just try to keep my eye out for her and make sure I can invite her in successfully. Um, but yeah, how's everybody's week going? It is Tuesday, and actually a very pretty one over here. And um, my morning has been taken up with my dog. I had to take him to his first vet appointment and that was fun. But now back in rocking and rolling with all things books and writing. So exciting stuff. I'm actually have some fun news that maybe we'll get to for this live. We'll see. If not, I'll definitely be announcing it later on in one of my other, uh, or maybe one of my one-on-one -on -one lives. We'll see. But and get invite and here we go hello hello hold on i'm just going to turn up my volume so i can hear you better that's fine it's okay i've been like readjusting it i was just uh as i was i always do just talk as i go but um <laughs> my, i have a new dog and so and he's a very big dog and so he likes to be next to you when you work and that means every day i have to rearrange my office space to make sure he has enough sprawl room and then if i'm doing one of these then i have to kind of resituate everything again so then <laughs> so I it's totally, a lot of movement. i totally <laughs> understand i have a, a giant uh old english bulldog like the big fat Ooh, wrinkly yeah 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 and she needs to be everywhere i am so i have to whenever i do stuff like this i have to make sure she's away with like the door shut <laughs> Exactly. That's why if you hear this murmuring, it's just because I just created him for this hour or so and um, try to get him to nap. He's not going to nap, but you know, that's the idea at least. <laughs> but yeah, thank you for coming out and doing this. I'm Thanks so excited. This is awesome. And um, I, I usually keep them very, very low key and everything. So what I usually do, um, since you're my co-host this week, I'll let you introduce yourself and what you write and what you love, and then we'll go from there. Okay. I am author Candace Osmond. I am a Canadian fantasy romance author. Um, I'm also a USA Today um, and international best-selling fantasy romance author. And I've been doing this for about ooh, close to 15 years now. And I've got like 30 books out that people can check out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's well, well. <laughs> That, that's a lot. That's a lot of books. And I, I'm very, I love it. I absolutely love that. Um, but yeah, 15 years and best selling. Like I've, I have not attempted trying to get one of the US um, a best selling authors because right now I'm exclusive through Amazon. And so I would have to be wide in order to um, be eligible for that. But I'll probably ask you a little bit about that in that process and how that all occurred for you in a moment. But so how many do you write in series or independent books? Because that's 30 books. So I'm trying to wrap my head around this. <laughs> um, now, over the course of 15 years, of course, some of those titles um, aren't available anymore. They've been taken down because when I first started, I was 100% indie and I didn't really know what I was doing. Yep. Yeah, okay. um, but um, yes, yeah, most of them are independent. Uh, a few of them are with small public publishers. Um, so I guess I'm more of like a hybrid author, Yeah, yeah. but I always consider myself indie first because most of my books are indie. It's what I love to do. Um, I just love the community. I love the process of it. I love having all the control over everything. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely the control. Yeah. <laughs> but no, that's cool. So I'm going back, but yes. So do you write in series or are your book totally, no, no it's okay, um, totally separate from each other? Because as a romance author, just depending on the author, sometimes they write in series, sometimes they're very independent. Yes. And so I just so, didn't know how you, your approach to that. Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, the, the quick answer is both. I have series, but I also have standalone books. Um, but like most people know, whether you're an author or a reader, series sell. Like readers love to get invested in a series. They love the characters and they w love, you know, the world building throughout and the relationship building throughout. 
the series, but I do love a good standalone. So I do write them every now and then. But most of my stuff is serial. Yeah. That's cool. No, and when you write in series, um, and this is just very different for me, since I'm a series writer, but I write epic fantasy. So it's the same group of people or person, you know, throughout the whole thing, theoretically. Um, but for when I talk to other uh, romance writers or, you know, they, a lot of times each book has like a different couple that they focus on that are all still related, but it's like, this is couple one, this is couple two, Bridgerton, yeah. think, think of that. I've, I mean, I, I've I don't really know how I've really done doing. that, but I, I admire the whole, that whole structure. So it's like a shared world kind of thing. So it's like the same sort of setting and sometimes like a side character from book one will get their mm -hmm. own book for book two, that kind of thing. So it's like different main characters for each book but if you love one of the books you'd probably love like the whole interconnected standalone series kind of thing i do i like that that's really cool so what are some of the names of your books do you have any to show you or show show and tell oh. or they're far <laughs> far away <laughs> it's okay, okay. It's okay. Um, okay. let's see um so there's my dark tide series which is six whole books it's completed and it's about time traveling Newfoundland pirates. So it's kind of like a mix between Outlander and Pirates of the Caribbean, but with like a lot more romance. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of one of my better sellers because it's one of my first series that really took off. Um, in since wrapping it up with six books, I just released a spinoff book for it. Um, and I also compiled all six books into a special edition omnibus with like the dark mode interiors you might have seen floating around on TikTok, like all the pages are black. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, another one of my series is uh, about time traveling Egyptian gods. And uh, that's called, um, <laughs> brain farts. Um, that one is called A Kingdom of Sand and Stars. Um, and that's three books right now, but there is a fourth one coming out probably sometime next year to sort of wrap up that series. Mm -hmm. And then my other series that I have is called the Iron World series, which is my newest. Um, there's only two books out right now, and it's about fae and vampires. And it's set in Halifax, Nova Scotia, because that's like my favorite city in Canada. Um, but yeah, that's probably one of my better sellers right now, just because it's newer. And people are like really into fae right now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, I feel like fae is one of those things that never really goes away, but there's definitely yeah. times when it becomes hyper popular. Yeah, and um, it goes yeah. up and it comes down. Yeah, exactly. So when you're choosing your ideas of like your myth and lore and the fantasy elements in your books, where does the you know that interest or inspiration come from? Because you were talking about you range everything from pirates to fae to um, <laughs> Egyptian deities to <laughs> yeah to grim. I have a standalone book that's about a grim reaper and <laughs> like, oh, there you go. <laughs> Um, most of my ideas come from uh, a lot of actual folklore, like being a Canadian, especially a Canadian in the Maritimes, like we have so much actual lore and history and mythology and stuff. And it's so easy to sort of have a little spark of an idea that just grows and expands. Like for my Dark Tide series, which is the time traveling pirates, um, I got the idea while I was in a thrift store and I saw a little ship in a bottle. And I was like, in my brain, I immediately was like, what if that was like a real ship, but like cursed to be in the bottle? And then pff, <laughs> it like went from there. So like ideas can come from anywhere. Sometimes I'll be reading another book or I'll be watching a movie and I'll say, well, I wouldn't have done it that way. I would have done it this way. And then I'll go do it that way. <laughs> love that. Yeah. No, I definitely love that. And um, talking to, you know, having been able to do this type of interface, with a variety of authors, it is very interesting to me, like where everybody gets ideas from, because um, some of the ones like uh, A.P. Beswick, his his uh, precursor for his retelling, dark retelling of British folklore, because he's um, up in the UK, um, came from watching a movie and he was like, I could tell the story better. You know, is it's that, just interesting. Is that the guy that did the Robin Hood retelling? Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Yeah, I've been meaning to read that. That looks really good. I love his TikToks and I love how he explains where he got his ideas and where it came from. Yeah, that's awesome. But kind of like you, you know, he started pulling from kind of localized lore and then, yeah. you know, also the inspiration goes around being down in the South in the U.S. There's, I don't know. I mean, yes, we, we, I guess we have Sasquatch 
I'm trying to think of like what what is our lore? There's not really, you know, like I pull I pull from like mythologies from all around the world when I write stuff. So, but it's kind of funny. I was like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of like outside the fact that everybody in the area is very proud with the Georgia Sat Squatch. <laughs> Hey, you never know. A Sasquatch romance fantasy or something might work. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. You you know, you don't knock it until you try it. But uh um, but yeah. spit it. Yep. <laughs> exactly. So what what um because you've been writing for 15 years and I don't know how many how much um years or time it took you before you because for me it took almost 10 years from the idea to finishing my first book so but you know i've been published as an author since 2016. um with that said how was your writing process like when did you decide i'm actually going to publish a book well it's sort of like a long and sidetracked road to (laughs) to get where i was so straight out of high school i knew i wanted to be a writer um which was a little longer ago than what i want to admit but um so i applied to several different schools for creative writing and i got accepted to all of them but like back then that was early 2000s so there was no independent publishing or like a really like big supportive indie community um that wasn't even heard of so everybody around me was like a writer you can be a writer that's not a job what are you gonna do with that so i decided to sort of set it aside and i became an interior designer for a few years um and went to school to study that but i always in the back of my head was writing this book and in my spare time i would constantly write down little notes about it so my very first book took me um probably seven or eight years to write it to okay, yeah, okay. Beginning yeah. to end. because like, you know it was just one of those things i didn't really tell anybody i was just like mm-hmm. kind of working on it in the, in the shadows um but as soon as i announced to everyone i was like yeah i wrote a book <laughs> my fa- friends and family were like what oh, um, and then i self-published it um i was actually one of the very first authors um to publish a full book on wattpad when wattpad first launched mm-hmm. i was actually one of the beta testers um yeah that's kind of where whether i think without that i wouldn't have gotten the sort of little leg up that i needed or like the little boost of confidence to go ahead with it so i really have to thank wattpad for that even though i haven't been on the app in years but um yeah so my first book took me a long time but after i did it my second book took me like a month (laughs) so i think it just depends on the writer it depends on how inspired you are, how much time you have to dedicate to it, that kind of thing. But yeah, it varies for me. I can write a book in a couple of weeks. I can write a book in a couple of years. It just really depends. Yeah, I have a very, when people ask that, you know, question like, how long does it take you to turn around a book? There are so many factors into it. It's not like, like an easy answer. answer. It's answer like, question. oh, it's eight months and like two days. I'm like, that's not how mine works. Like no. I, I one write, um, novellas as well as full length books. So that factors into it, but also the fact that, again, I had this layered approach where I'm always working on writing a project, editing another, going through beta reading or, you know, receiving stuff from a true editor for another and then formatting and promoting. And so I have multiple works going on at the same time. So because of that, it looks like I'm putting out a lot of stuff each year, but it's just because I have this layered staggered approach. Like a train. I would really yeah, I would really have to think about like how much time I put into each project independent of all the other stuff to mm-hmm. figure that out. And I wouldn't know. <laughs> I don't have time to sit down and track all that. Like, like you said, I'm the same way. I'll be writing a book, editing another one, outlining another one, working on this and that for another one. <laughs> right. yeah. So how, how much time a day do you get, are you able to sit down and write? Or work on bookish stuff, I guess you should say. Well, I have children, so right now <laughs> my time is very scattered. But when they're in school, um, I have a very, I, I want to say strict, but it's not really that strict. But I, I try to hold myself to a schedule. While they're in school, I get up, and once they're on the bus, um, I just basically write all day long until they come home. Wow. Yeah. Very now, nice. sometimes that involves just staring at my screen. <laughs> Back to back always. There are there many days like that. I think that's going to be me later today. Usually I am the best. 
I realized I'm a morning writer. I like to write yeah. new material in the morning and then leave the afternoons to editing, formatting, all that other kind of stuff. Or if I'm, because I'm also a painter, if I'm doing a painting project that in the afternoon. But um, because I'm flipping it around today, uh, I have a feeling that I'm going to be staring at the screen longer than I want because whatever it is, my brain's wired to work new material in the morning and then the afternoon, I'm probably going to be like, put something on the screen, put this, let me <laughs> put words down. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I can relate to that. It's once I get into a routine uh, and then I like switch it up, it's hard to switch it up. It's like, well, I've been writing in the morning for two years. Now I'm editing all of a sudden in the morning. My brain just doesn't want to do it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But so, do you prefer any particular time of day for writing or are you just good if that's just, um, you know, schedule just to sit down and? I'm definitely the most creative. No. I'm definitely the most productive. I wouldn't say creative. I'm the most productive earlier, like before lunchtime. After lunchtime, my brain starts to kind of wander because I have attention problems. And it's like, well, what else can I do? And I should check my emails and I should send a newsletter and blah, blah, blah. Right. So definitely I try to get my writing because to me, that's the most important part. You have to write the book. Otherwise, none of the other stuff matters. Right. So I try to get the writing done in the morning if I can. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I'm definitely full on morning person, but no, that's, I don't know. I always think it's neat because I've talked to some people and they're like, my best time to write is put the kids to bed and write till two or to 4 a.m. And I'm like, <gasps> I like sleep. I yeah, appreciate I your sleep. commitment to the craft, but I like sleep. <laughs> I can, I can write in the evenings if I'm on a deadline. Yeah. But fine. If I'm on a deadline. I, I can literally write at the kitchen table while we're eating. I can write in the mornings. I can write at night because I know that I have to do it. Like, I don't have a choice. I'm on a deadline, that kind of thing. So, but without a deadline, I kind of just stick to my mornings. I get that. I totally understand. Now, for, for the point, and this is something that I'm always trying to figure out how to do the best for myself. Um, when it comes to the point of you have your book, it's ready to release. How much time do you give yourself before actually releasing for like the preliminary promotion or do you even promote it or you just say, it's here? Well, <laughs> um, that's a really good question actually, because I know that a lot of authors are totally different. Like if you have, I know authors that have a huge following and they can just wake up one day and be like, here's a book. And then it's a bestseller, right? Because they have this huge following. That's, you know, they'll one click that book no matter what. Um, but for me, I don't consider myself that big yet, <laughs> hopefully one day, but uh, I definitely do put a lot of planning into my releases. So once the book is done, I like to give myself at least three months because then that means that's a month of, you know, sort of teasing it online, that kind of thing. I also have a PR team that I work with. Um, so that gives me time to sort of do up little PR packages and mail them out and gives them time to receive it and that kind of thing. Um, it also gives me a lot of uh, time in advance to book um, like paid promo, like um, paid newsletters, book bobs, that kind of thing, because those platforms usually require at least a month's notice yeah. if you want to get, you know, the date that you want to get kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I like to give myself like a three month window. Usually, if I can, sometimes I get a little anxious and I'm like, it's coming out next month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think. Right now I'm trying to figure out again, the best method for my style of writing, but because I'm doing it, I don't know what the true definition for rapid release is, but uh, my novellas, because I do try to release four in a year, mm -hmm. um, I don't allot as much, you know, preliminary promotion time just because I'm trying to, you know, release multiple in a year. So that, I don't know if that hurts me or benefits me because once people start reading, you know, they're ready for the next yeah. one, next one. But again, counterbalancing, I'm releasing two series simultaneously. So I have my one year release of my full length mm -hmm. and that, that series I want to dedicate and make sure I have a lot more time to be like, hey, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm afraid that people forgot, you know, yeah, it's exactly. been a year. I'm like, the thing. you never... gotta kind of find the sweet spot. You don't want to wait too long in between releases, but you also don't want to release them too fast either. So I think it, it also, it's different for series. So like you should put everything into releasing the first book. Like that's going to launch everything. That's going to build your platform. That's going to mm -hmm. 
that's where you start, right? So once the first book is out and you have the second and third ready, I don't think you need to wait as long in between books in the series, that kind of thing, because then people will be waiting. Um, I don't, I would never do anything less than a month. That's just too soon. I think for me, a good rapid release plan is one every two months. I did that with my Dark Tide series when it first came out and I, you, I could have probably even did one every three months, but I did one every two months and I think that was one of the key things that really elevated the popularity of, of that series, for sure. Yeah, the, the thing is like, I know when you get that sweet spot for a true rapid release process, um, you really do. You keep the attention of the readers, you keep your fan base, you don't risk losing people just because they forgot they started something and then they get distracted by something else. Um, the counter side for the author is that you have to make sure you're prepped and ready to go because when you're going, you're, <laughs> you're There's no ahead. stopping that train. You have to just go with it. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and like a two month window in between releases also gives you like just the right amount of time to keep your readers engaged, share some teasers, that kind of thing. Keep them re remembering what they loved about the last book, that kind of thing while promoting the next one. I think two months is a really good sweet spot for sure. And you mentioned like you do uh, PR boxes in that point of time. Like what kind of stuff do you put in your PR box outside of, is it any, is it just the book? Is it a book and some information about it? A bookmark? Like what, what kind of stuff do you do when you create these bundles um, to kind of. So for specifically for my PR team, um, because I only just started my PR team this year, um, I spent the last two years planning everything I wanted to do and all the, like the special little goodies and stuff I wanted to give them and giveaways and that kind of thing. Um, I haven't actually sent any full boxes yet. I'm going to be doing that with my current release that just came out today, which is this one. Yeah, I know. Look. And look. Oh, lovely. <laughs> I'm so, excited. so they'll be getting little PR boxes for that. and what I'll include is a copy of the book and it'll be signed. Um, and then also at least one piece of character art, a bookmark, um, and then some kind of either one or two bookish merch things, like maybe an annotation set or, um, let me think, um, you know, a candle, like a, a mug, like anything like that, that I can think of at a time. And I'll just put it all in there and pack it up all neatly for them kind of thing yeah so um my I, my PR team actually just did a cover reveal f with me so I sent out these little cover reveal um PR envelopes they're all black and it had like a little black wax seal and inside was just a print of the cover so that way I could afford to send out more of them and get everybody on the team involved rather than just kind of pick and choose like I know a lot of authors just pick and choose people that have like the most following and that kind of thing and I didn't really want to do that like if people were interested enough to join my team because either they like my books or they just wanted to be involved or they're trying to grow their pages or their platforms. I thought I'm going to include everybody then. So I figured sending them a print of the cover and like a little bookmark or some art and that kind of thing is just a great little way to get it started. I love that. I love it. And let's Let's rewind for a second. You just said you had a release today. I did. Yeah, I kind of just skimmed over. Why did we start with that? Okay. Talk about your release a little bit more. So okay. Anyway. So The Vicious Dark is a standalone. It won't be a series. And it's a, a mix of sci-fi and romanticy. And it's about human cloning and immortality. And it's all my books are set in Canada. They all have Canadian set settings. This one is set in Toronto. Um, because it's like big city. I was actually born in Ontario. Shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> I say I'm a Newfoundlander because this is where I was raised. But uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I was born in Ontario. I spent a lot of time living in Toronto. So I always pick settings of places I've either visited or lived in. So then I can write things sort of from like my actual perspective and what I experienced there, that kind of thing. But um, yeah, this one launched today with a Kickstarter. And you can only get this version with the metal co uh, corners and the sprayed edges and stuff in the Kickstarter. It won't be available anywhere else afterwards. Um, but you can also get just a regular paperback and a regular hardcover. But there's also like mystery book boxes and like other book boxes and goodies and that kind okay, of thing. I'm gonna like have to like poke around in your Kickstarter <laughs> because I did my first Kickstarter uh, early this year and I'm still so fascinated what everybody does and to promote their books for that kind of funding. 
projects. So that's really cool. I know it's such a great platform and it's so supportive and like there's people they want to support your campaign. They don't just want to buy a book. They want to give you their money. They want to support you and see you create more awesome projects. And this is my third bookish Kickstarter. Um, I did my first one last year for the Dark Tides Omnibus with the black pages that I was mentioned earlier. Um, and it was a hit. I loved it. It was so much fun. And then my second Kickstarter was for the Dark Tides spinoff book which just wrapped up like last month and it doubled in funding from my first one. So I'm just like, launch this one today. I have no expectations. I'm just letting it go however it goes, but it's already pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, that's one thing. It's like Kickstarters, like at least my experience, I enjoy the ride and I definitely want to try it again, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. Um, and depending on how much you want to do for the promotion side, which I don't know how much you do for the Kickstarter aspect of promoting, but you know, it's a lot, it's a, it's a lot of work, it's but lot of work. Hopefully and it's, it's just as much work, maybe even a little more work than a regular release, but it's more fun because, or for me anyway, it's more fun because I can actually like interact with every single person that supports the launch and I can, you know, put little love notes in, in every single package. And like, I just, I love that aspect of it, of really like connecting with people and building a platform and not just selling a book. Like I'm giving away lots of stuff. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, are you doing your own sprayed edges? Because I know a lot of people just absolutely love that. And I don't know, I feel like it would be fun to try. On the other hand, I would hate to mess up books. <laughs> okay. I do my own. I have my own actual uh, little bookish shop in my house. Um, I took my spare bedroom and I completely gutted it and converted it into an actual shop with like an assembly line and everything. But I want it. <laughs> it's awesome. It's so much fun. Um, and I do do my own sprayed edges, but they're easy now that I've figured everything out. But in the beginning, I just took, um, I went to the thrift store here in town and I just got a few just sort of um, like, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like just ones that I could mess up and yeah, not yeah. care too much about it. Um, and I just practice until I got it right. And I, I know other authors do their own sprayed edges and they have their own techniques for it. Um, I found what works for me and yeah. So I love it. It's super fun. <laughs> Cause I'm also crafty. So it's like Kickstarters are a great way to release a book, but it also like appeases that need to like start a new hobby all the time. <laughs> Because I'm so crafty. I love to paint. I love, you know, making things like that. And then I have a Cricut that I got last year. No, the year before. So now I can actually use it to like make stuff and merch and apparel. Oh, so. that, would that would be nice. <laughs> These are my bucket list things for like my, my future office right now. I live in a small apartment. And, um, but yeah, it's one of the things I've been talking about is like in the next place, have a true office where I can definitely have one whole side for what you're saying is for the bookish, you know, your, your shop, your merch, your, yeah. all that kind of stuff to you create need that some space for packing those things. And oh, yeah. when I first started, my office was in my bedroom <laughs> and yeah. well, it just yeah. kind of grew from there. Right. So you just, a lot of people think you have to jump all in and have everything ready in the beginning, but you don't just start with what you have, work with what you have. I started out in my bedroom and then I upgraded to a storage room in my house that I upgraded to an actual full bedroom. And who knows, one day I might have an actual like building that I rent. I don't know <laughs> how it's yeah. going to go. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. Because like you said, you can come up with so many cool things, especially for Kickstarter. One of the things that I, I think they're packed. I have a mound of all my bookish stuff for projects. Um, but one of the things I came up with was doing 3D printed miniatures of my characters that I hand painted. And that was one of the things for my Kickstarter was That's you get awesome. to have a little character and they were, they dueled as a uh, TTRPG. So D and D style characters for people who like that kind of yes. overlay. It came with all the stuff, the character sheet and all this stuff. So you could play as my character, Katie of earth for that series. Because with you being I, epic fantasy author, um, you, those, your readers would most likely be yeah, interested in theoretically, stuff. Like that. Theoretically. Really <laughs> That's an awesome idea. But yeah, then, and when I was thinking about you, you mentioned something I don't know. Uh, obviously, I don't, um, you're past, I guess, the heavy promotions of that particular series, but the one you were talking about, Pirate Ship in a Bottle, you should find little pirate ships and bottles. And for, a, yep. Why haven't I ever thought about that? <laughs> right now, I'm 
talking to my head immediately. The story. Oh my gosh. See, I love that because like now that I'm training my head on what can I do that's bookish related for fun promo stuff, it's, uh, it's yeah, you just have to train your head to think of those things. And so when yeah. you said that, immediately jumped in, find a, you know, it doesn't have to be those super fancy, you know, hundreds of dollars, you know, thing, but like something small, a little ship in the yeah, bottle. Something that readers can only get from you, right? Yeah. That makes it more special. It makes it a collectible. It, you know, that's... Now that's all I can think about. <laughs> <laughs> or or counterbalance. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if they exist. I, Etsy has so much stuff. They probably do. Or you can find some and make it. But like have a teeny little, little, um, oh, I, not really. I'm trying to think of like the term. Um, my, my gross plan, I am blanking right now. It's only Tuesday, Katie. It's not good. <laughs> um, but many, many like pirate ship and somehow attach it to a bookmark so it's like you know instead of like yes. a tassel i did actually um i found a charm supplier oh, on yeah. on etsy and i bought a bulk amount of little swords and little pirate ships and little compasses and stuff and then i've got these like little metal bookmarks that you can add a tassel to but i think i'm gonna add the tassel but like a little charm on it as well yeah, so nice. <laughs> I love it. Oh, brilliant brilliant <laughs> But it's that, that's why I love these kind of yeah. one uh these kind of interfacing you know chats because sometimes you just come up with fun things. Who yeah. knows if anybody's ever going to do these ideas? But you know they're just fun ideas to toss yeah. out there. Exactly. I love it. I absolutely love it. But yeah, <laughs> um, for your for your crafting, um, you spray your own edges. Do you put the little metal edges on your book? Because that I've never seen that, and that's fascinating to me. This is actually the first book that I'm trying it with. So I did buy the metal edges myself wholesale. So I got like a big bulk amount of them. But there's limited, obviously limited amount that I have. So in the campaign, there's only so many copies of this edition that you can get. But yeah, I put them on myself and get I steal my husband's tools and I'm like eh. that is so cool. but yeah and I got them on the front and the back I know some people just oh, put them on the front but they're on all four sides that's beautiful yeah yeah I need to figure out how to up my book game like I, I and have like fancy books like you or you know that's cool that is absolutely cool message me anytime I I have um group chats with like all my author friends and we're always like brainstorming little things for merch ideas and stuff so message me oh, anytime yeah. I can always brainstorm with you see that's what I need as I I'm hoping I always say when, when I have time and time's not an existent thing so I need to like just carve it out of this nothingness but when I have time my my goal for this year towards the end of the year is to put a bookshop function and embed it into my um, website which my author website which I hadn't done before so I'm mm -hmm. trying to teach myself how to do that so then I can offer some of these things because um, I'm like I'm well behind like I don't know where to get like the really cool stickers I do a couple but they're like very base level but like really cool sticker stickers or enamel pens or anything that you know right now everybody's talking about I'm like I'm like way behind I'm like I'm catching up Honestly, <laughs> just spend some time looking around Etsy because there's all kinds of makers and suppliers and stuff that you just send them your design and they'll make your enamel pin or you send them your design and they'll they'll print um the sublimation stuff to like put on mugs and things and like it's ready to go you just take it plunk it on your item and just put it in a heat press or whatever you need like etsy's awesome <laughs> for authors they've got so many crafty little things there that you can buy that make it so much easy to, to make your stuff yeah for sure but yeah that's a time because i've spent a long a lot of time like looking into this and curating lists and links and sources and yes please be my guru please teach me <laughs> teach me your ways <laughs> no that is fascinating i love it and that's so exciting so um your kickstarter link is you can find through your yeah, profile if, you just, if anybody is interested you can just head to my page and just click the little link in my bio and it's the very first one that pops up when you click it and you just yeah just go check it out it's going to be running for 30 days and you'll be able, you can get like there's something for every type of reader and every type of budget. You can just get an ebook if you want, or you can just get a regular paperback. But the cool thing is that no matter what you get, because we actually funded in like five minutes today, <laughs> so we're set. So for the next 30 days, I'm just going to be constantly rolling out like bonus goodies that everybody gets. 
like no matter what. So if you just go and you just get a regular signed paperback, you're also going to get all the extra goodies that I add throughout the 30 days. I love that. And do you, I don't know. I've seen a, it's something I dabbled with and I reached like the first level, but what do you call it? The stretch goals. Do you yeah. try to do stretch goals to encourage people? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, one thing that I definitely learned with my first campaign is don't determine what your stretch goals are going to be at certain amounts because you don't know how your funding is going to go. Right. Um, some people take days to reach their funding and then all their plans for their stretch goals kind of went out the window. So I kind of just, I know what I have for stretch goals, like the items, and then I'm just going to do the, the milestones, I guess the, the, the lines that I want to cross as I go. So, um, I have things like little vellum, those clear, transparent, like overlay sheets with the art on it. I've got those planned. I've got um, little leather, like leather journals. I've got extra, um, character art and stuff that my designer is working on. I've got all kinds of little goodies that as the higher we go with the funding, everyone's going to get it. Oh, that's so cool. I know so much fun. <laughs> I did love that. Yeah, what I did, um, just because I did, um, it was my first Kickstarter, and I set specific price goals so people knew what I was working for, but then, yeah. you know, talked about what they would be getting. Um, and like I said, I did reach one, I'm trying, yeah, I did reach one of them and was kind of close to the second. But what it did was I went ahead because I was taking advice from one person saying, you know, if you're trying to fund um, a project where you're like, hey, I'm going to fund commissioning this piece obviously you don't have it ready behind the yeah. scenes but that's one of the reasons why you're trying to hit that stretch goal which um financially was a smart thing to do but after that whole kickstarter i was like i'm gonna go ahead and try to do a couple of these others and have them ready so the next time again going forward with the series and promoting that series i'll have even more goodies available yeah. for people so and like so it's, it's a learning thing. yeah and stretch goals don't have to be these crazy elaborate things they can be super fun very personal things like um, my first time around, um, I think my first stretch goal was I would create a playlist of the songs that I used while writing the book mm -hmm. and share it publicly with everybody. Like things like that. Like they don't really cost you anything except for a little bit of time. And it's really cool and kind of exclusive sort of, right? Or mm -hmm. you could um, use something like um, you'll do a live reading of you reading a chapter from the book, like stuff like that, um, that people can do for their, their earlier Kickstarters just to kind of, you know, amp it up a little bit without having to invest in, you know, commissioning new art and that kind of thing, which is That's cool, but you can save that for like later, um, like higher stretch yes, goals, yes. right? Yeah. That's cool. Like I said, that's why I like to, when I find other authors who are doing um, Kickstarter since, um, I like to kind of stalk all you guys because i want to know i want to know what everybody else is doing i want to know how to improve my own and also you know just get an idea of what people want because as an author there are things that i think you may want but maybe you don't maybe you'd rather something else that's yeah, totally different that's that's... Point. yeah you can kind of like watch from the sidelines what other people are doing that's like oh that didn't work i probably won't do that <laughs> but that works so i will do that <laughs> yeah. and of course that's to make sense with what you're pitching your genre and everything and um because maybe something you do may not be what works for mine like maybe you and here's another idea maybe you have a secret love note between your two characters that you print out and send out um as a goodie but that wouldn't necessarily work for mine because i'm not romance forward so yes. i would have to come up but with something else for you like something like um maybe like a, an ancient scroll or something that has like a like a a puzzle that readers have to like decode or something oh, you know yeah. like things like that it re yeah it really just depends on your genre and what your readers are going to like and what they expect yeah oh that's fun i love this <laughs> <laughs> So, so with your Kickstarter of taking up your next 30 days, what is your next part of this year, the last part of this year, we're already in the second half, going to entail? Are you trying to do any other releases or is this kind of it when you just promote so upcoming This year, things? I don't know if it's just me or if you feel it or anybody else feels it, but I feel like this year has just like flown by. I had so many plans and it's like, oh my God, summer is already like almost half over. It's crazy. Yep. But no, I do have lots of plans. So um, my next project after this one is a co-author project with one of my best friends in the whole world is author JJ King. She's also here on TikTok and she writes 
I'm like more of a fantasy romance author. She's paranormal romance and oh, she's a little smuttier and spicier. Um, and she writes mostly about werewolves and that kind of thing. She just uh, launched a new series that's about a monster slayer. So it's like a little bit of everything, vampires, oh. werewolves, witches, fae, all that kind of stuff. Um, but a few years ago, we wrote um, three short novels, like long novellas together um, about time traveling uh, Celtic witches. And we sort of just sidelined it and backburnered it um, because we both didn't have the time dedicated to really make the series fly. Um, so next month, we're actually sitting down together. We've had this time penciled in for like two years now. Um, and we're going to revamp it and we're going to make it one big, beautiful book. And we're going to launch it with a Kickstarter in October because it's witches and it's like Halloween, that kind of thing. Of course. Um, yeah. So that's going to be super fun. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that is so cool. I've never co-authored at this moment, but I'm a little bit of a control freak. So I don't know how that would work well. It's me. hard. It's not My for friend. everybody. Yeah. It's I definitely not for be... everybody. You I have to pick and more... choose your yeah, co-author yeah. very carefully. Yeah, and you have to have that nice relationship and trust relationship and be able to give and take advice and all that kind of stuff. But I think I would be a little more interested in doing an anthology and being a part of that kind of thing. Yes. So that's a great cross promotion. But uh, I haven't done that either. But it's something that on the back of my mind, I'm like, it would be kind of fun to do something like that. I've been in point. a few anthologies. And I like it because you still re retain all that control over your individual book mm -hmm. or your individual story um, while still participating in like a group Actually, it's probably a really good place to start for anyone who's interested in working with other authors or co-authoring or anything like that. Join like an anthology project because that'll give you sort of a crash course on what it's like to work with other authors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Because I know people who enjoy doing them and there's so many great reasons for both the author and the reader to um, partake or read anthologies because for a reader you get to sample a whole bunch of authors at once yes. and maybe a genre or theme that's interesting to you because usually they have some kind of reason why they're compiled together and then as an author it's great cross promotion <laughs> it is because you can promote like you're promoting one title but the title is the anthology and like 20 other people are also promoting that same title so yeah it's it's a group effort and but it only works if everybody is on board if everybody is doing the same amount of work um because you do you know when you have large groups like i did an anthology once i think there was like like 25 or 27 authors and maybe half of us were really doing the work that that needed to be done that kind of thing but yeah you just gotta pick and choose and just enter projects like that carefully <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah but i mean it's all it's all Everything's a Everything is like testing and figuring out what works for you as an author, especially if you're new or newer into that craft. But yeah, no, that's cool. So how many years then ahead are you already playing out? As you said, you had one thing penciled in two years in advance. So I'm like, okay, like you probably have the next five years kind of all set. <laughs> I am, I'm literally staring at my board right here on the side of my whiteboard and I've got um, my, writing, editing, and release projects pretty solid until mid-2024, um, but then I've got other loose projects um, that are in the pipeline kind of thing um, for after that that would take me well into 2026, yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> I feel crazy saying that. Oh, no, no, that's great. No, I... For me, when I have like a series, it's one of the reasons I like writing in the series is I already know how many books are going to be in there, it's the way my brain functions. And so I can kind of work out at least, you know, I know I'm going to be kept busy for this, this amount of time. Yeah, kind of know year. roughly how long it takes you to write each book. So you mm -hmm. factor that in and you factor in your promo time. And yeah, you can sort of plan ahead with series for sure. I like that. Okay. Now for yours, um, I do want to make sure I ask a couple questions. Uh, what kind of formats can people find for your book? You mentioned a few of them earlier, but I just wanted to yes. reiterate to make sure people know what they can get yeah, out of you. That's a good question. So um, in the campaign, as soon as you click on it, you'll see like a little bit about the book and then it goes right into the different options available. So you can just get the ebook, 
you can just get a paperback or just a regular hardcover or you can get this is what's called like the Lux edition so it's the metal and the sprayed and hardcover and yada yada um, so those are the four formats that you can get then uh, the next sort of level about that is you can get any of those formats as a bundle so like an ebook bundle would have the ebook plus printable art and then the paperback bundle would have a paperback plus an actual art print and so on with the with the other versions um then the next level after that are book boxes so you can get a paperback book box which has a signed copy of the paperback and then a bunch of like bookish merch in them and then the same thing with with each version so yeah and then <laughs> Throughout the 30 days, I'm also I'm also going to post um, what's called flash rewards. So every other day, I'll post something in the campaign. I'll say I have 10 of these black tumblers with like a bookish quote on it. Um, and there's only 10 available for like first come first serve that kind of thing. And you can like build your own book box kind of thing if you just pick the book. And then throughout the campaign, you can be like, oh, I want. I want that item and that item and and so on and plus you would get all the bonus rewards that unlock for free so it's like you're really building your own kind of bookish box that's cool i never thought about that that's really neat so for your flash ones do you just add something that day with the number that's available yeah so like with my last campaign um i had i think two or three flash rewards and that's kind of what gave me the idea of like building your own book box because i was like okay if they pick just the book and then these flash rewards pop up, they can, you know, they're optional. You don't have to get them, but if you want them, then you can sort of just grab them real quick and put it in your box kind of thing. And I had um, uh, a coffee mug and you got to pick whatever saying that I would put on it for you, like customize your mug. Um, another one was um, some bookmarks. Another one was like a candle, that kind of thing. So for this one, I do have five flash rewards planned. So you can just pop over just get the paperback and leave it at that and just wait for the flash goals. And if something pops up that you want, you can just real quick and add it to your order because um, you're not actually charged anything until the campaign is over, which makes sense and is awesome because you can change whatever you want. You can downgrade, you can upgrade, you can add yep. throughout yep. the whole campaign. So yeah. That's Mm -hmm. I love that idea. That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. No, that is fantastic. <laughs> so for all your books, the ones who are not part of this particular campaign, I'm assuming then you can they can be um, purchased or as ebook, paperback, hardcover. Do you do any audiobooks at this moment or you just stick with the uh, print? No, and the e I, do. I just started um, developing all my books into audio right now. My Dark Tide series about the time traveling pirates is the only one that I've got complete. Um, so there's six audiobooks available for that, and so now I'm just working on my next series. The thing with audiobooks is they just take so long, right? Because you, you have to work with the, the, the narrator and send things back and forth for months. I think it took me a solid year to get my Dark Tide series finished in audio. Okay. They but, range wild, widely for mine, so yeah. it just depends on the project, the complexity, the length of the book, lots of things. Yeah, uh, definitely. Availability of the narrator. Yeah, you know. exactly. Because right now they're starting to get all, all booked up. I think mine books up almost like a year in advance. So you really got to kind of plan ahead with with audiobooks. It's audiobooks is a whole different world, I find, for authors. Like it, it's none of the same stuff applies for promo. None of the same stuff applies for releasing. Yeah, um, I'm not so, yeah. Out how to market them outside of just on it's my own hard. platform saying hey they exist yeah. these are the ones that are available right now these are this is what's coming up or something like that but yeah. um yeah i haven't figured that world out but at least i'm kind of like you where i'm slowly starting to convert all of my stuff um into the audiobook yeah. format for future just takes time yes mm. and money sometimes depending on how you do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> There is there is that, is that whole <laughs> just a little small part of it <laughs> oh yeah um, but yeah, let me also ask, because it's another one I always love to make sure I inquire about, because what I do is I usually repurpose uh, these chats onto my YouTube channel in a few weeks, and then I'll put all your you know links and all that stuff below so people can find you and your book. And I'll try to make sure I put it up quick enough so people can join your Kickstarter <laughs> as well. But with that said, where can people find and follow you? Do you have a website? Do you have a newsletter? What are your other socials outside of Book Talk? 
everything. So <laughs> I do have a website. It's just authorcandaceosman.com. Um, and that's sort of like the hub for everything. So if you are ever looking for anything I do, you can just head to my website and somewhere on there will lead you to what you're looking for. But all my books are on all retailers because I'm wide. So it's Amazon, Kobo, iBooks, Barnes & Noble, like everywhere. It's They're also in some bookstores. I'm not sure which ones. Um, you kind of just got to go in. If they're not there, you can just ask and they can get them in, that kind of thing. Um, also, I'm on all socials, Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, although I just joined Threads and I think I might... Um, I don't know. I, I've heard that. I know that one's a new one, and people yeah, are kind of. Yeah, like, it's funny mm -hmm. watching the little rivalry going on between Twitter and Threads right now. Like I'm in both places, I will remain in both places. But uh, Threads is definitely really interesting. But TikTok is kind of the place where I hang out the most, so that's where the most up to date things about what I'm doing will will always be. I do have a newsletter, which you can always find on my website, and. Um, where else? Oh, I also have a, a bookshop on Etsy where you can get signed copies and like all my special editions and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> yeah. No, that's cool. Yeah. And that's where like right now, um, when I try to sell my signed copies, I have an Etsy just because until I can figure out this whole store thing, which is it's overwhelming to me. I don't know. I'm not very techie and just trying to like figure out how to yeah, design. I was going to add a shop to my thing. website too, but after I used Etsy, I was like, mm, you know what? It's just so much easier. I know that there's fees and stuff involved, but they're very minimal and it just makes it so much easier. And like the whole process of creating the shipping labels and they provide tracking to everyone who buys stuff for me. And like, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I had, yeah, I definitely am probably just going to stick with Etsy. No, that's good. Like for me, I think it, it got a little muddy because that's where I used to sell and still do do my self um, cu custom pet portraiture and all that other stuff for my art side. So it's like book, art, 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 book, book, art, art, art. And it's just <laughs> yeah. like I should have done two separate shops. But at the time I was like trying to put something up there um, out of necessity and not thinking like this potentially could be a long term thing. And maybe I should have yeah. split it. But but yeah, it's Which also you can less is more. It. <laughs> that's true that's true but like for me it's like almost like less is more there are so many socials there are so many places that as an author you're always kind of going around and bouncing between and trying to uh you know just be present and keep up and maintain it can yeah. be exhausting <laughs> and then you're like you have to write by the you way you don't want to uh, just like post the same thing on every single platform like you want to provide a little bit of variety like post pretty pictures on instagram post funny videos on tiktok and post updates on facebook like it's it does get exhausting um i do find planning my content ahead like i try to do it a month in advance like just basic content um just like general stuff about books and reading and that kind of thing and i'll pre-schedule a lot of that stuff so that it just posts for me and then each day I get up and I check comments and I interact with people and it's fun I just never have to think about what am I going to post today because that's the worst <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. and, yes I do like the the ability now to be able to schedule posts on a lot of platforms I utilize it on some far more than others maybe I should try to utilize it but yes it's all just trying to figure out the best schedule for me Saves a lot of time. One day a month, I sit down for like two hours. I create all my content for the month, schedule it, and never think about it again. And then I can just like have fun and talk with people in the comments and stuff. I love it. Absolutely yeah. love it. <laughs> well, since we are kind of rounding the hour, I wanted to make sure also, and this is always my last of my, my triple A questions, um, always like to ask and see, is there any topic that we did not cover or any questions that you had that you wanted to ask in general? that you know before the we wrap up today that we just make sure you get out you know this whatever you want to get out or you know tell people whatever you want to tell i think we covered Pick everything up. i'd love to know where to get your books where are your oh, books okay. <laughs> right now and that's the thing is down the line and tentatively next year i will when i have again figure out this thing called time um change things up but right now i'm exclusive through zon so um, ebooks, paperback, hardcover, and um, the audiobooks that are available you can find through Zon, Kindle Unlimited, Kindle, Audible, that kind of stuff yeah. at the moment. And then, of course, signed copies of paperback and hardcover have an Etsy shop right now for that as well. But um, 
keeps it pretty simple. But down the line, I do think I want to expand the print versions wide. I just, because I'm doing it backwards, it's going to take me a lot more time because I have to go back and reformat and everything. I was in KU for years and well, I, when I first started like a decade and a half ago, I was wide because I didn't even know about KU. Okay. Um, and after being wide for a few years and developing relationships with other authors and I joined like groups on Facebook and that kind of thing, everybody was in Kindle Unlimited and I was like, okay, well, I'll do that. I was in Kindle Unlimited for years and I just, I found I really miss my wide readers and my wide fan base. So like maybe a year and a half ago, I made the transition out of Kindle Unlimited. Like you said, you were planning on doing and eventually went wide. So yeah, I'm, I was in the same boat you are right now. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the fun thing, like I didn't realize up until probably, you know, six months ago that it, you can keep your ebook in KU, but have your print books wide. There's yes. no thing yeah. there. And so I think that's my yeah. do the print books wide, see how that goes, and then maybe move my ebooks um wide potentially, just depending on how KU is functioning at that time of <laughs> the world, because you know, people love or hate it. It all just depends on the day, it feels like. <laughs> well, I know um a lot of authors in sort of in my circle, they'll they'll launch a series in KU and let it ride out until the series is done. Then they'll take the series out and put it wide. So you kind of like get the best of both worlds sort of thing. And that's so nice. Yeah, I do like that approach of um, waiting until the series is complete. So your K readers, you know, just say, okay, you have a couple more weeks, get it or else it's, you know, it. <laughs> it's moving over. Um, because right now I only have one complete series and that's my dark, um, new adult shifter fantasy it's a war-based series and there are four books and that one you know i could theoretically say okay last chance last call move it over and then whenever my next my other two series you know wrap up give the little buffer and be like okay we're starting to fold over and we'll see but for you since you've gone back and forth have you seen any great benefit of being on one side or the other or yes, um, outside of the fact you Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's maybe just my genre or if it's just the readership that I, I built in the beginning, but Kindle Unlimited didn't really, it didn't, like it worked, but it didn't work the same. Like it didn't work as well. Um, a lot of authors are like, oh, it's so easy. You just put your books in Kindle Unlimited and they sell themselves. I was working way harder when I was in Kindle Unlimited to promote my books. It was insane. So I just don't think like my books are not heavy fantasy i would say like mid mid fantasy with lots of romance um i think i guess those just perform better wide and i don't regret re <laughs> can't speak i don't regret um going wide at all i definitely would not go back to ku af after seeing how much better being wide is for me i mean everybody's different right so yeah, no, and I, I agree. I've heard that it just depends on the genre and, uh, and you know, maybe your following as well, you know, yeah. your specific following. So there is a lot of factors that play into it. And that's one of the reasons why at one point my bread and butter was through KU for all the books. Like that was 75 to 80 percent of my income was coming through just that. So for me to consider stepping away from it is a little scary, so, but I've also heard that depending on... um your books and where you make the most money be it print or audio or that it may benefit you to switch over so yeah definitely like for me exactly for me um my biggest seller are paperbacks on every single platform even on amazon paperbacks are like i would say 90 percent of the sales i make and i don't know why i don't really promote them a whole lot it's just my readers prefer physical books i guess right so for me to be in kindle unlimited wouldn't really make a whole lot of sense and i think that's that's where it came from yeah i think if i saw that shift over with print uh that would make me a little more comfortable if i was making more but again my print books are right now exclusive through Zon. so next year if i do make that transition with the print versions wide and see any big difference that may help me you know adjust yeah. well, it's a good place to start win. for sure yeah yeah and I have a comment saying, uh, have a Kindle, sell them, use it, even though you like books. So, you know, I understand. I understand. You know, everybody, I hate, everybody has their preference. I'm a print person. I like, you know, hardcover or paperback. I like that. That is my jam. But I, I respect people who like paperbacks, you know, collect hardcovers. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
Ah, there you go. I love it. And your collectible hardcover is so cool. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you for it. We reached the hour and thank you for hanging out with me today. I know it's kind of an odd time of day, but I appreciate getting to know you and yeah. meet you and talk about your launch of your Kickstarter. That's so exciting. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is actually my very first Kickstarter, or not Kickstarter, like Kickstarter on the brain. This is my first TikTok live. So, yeah. Aww. <laughs> okay. It's always, at least when you begin, um, for me, I it was always more comfortable having someone to talk to versus yeah. staring at the screen that's, and just and talking. That's why I never did it. I was like, I could do a live, but what would I talk about? Like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm yeah. not that interesting. <laughs> I realized because it was during my Kickstarter campaign, one of the ways I was promoting the fact that I had it is I would turn on lives. Again, we would talk about whatever. It could be fantasy, could be day-to-day -day stuff, could be, you know, my writing or publishing or that. But I would always make sure I would bring up the topic periodically of the Kickstarter. It was a great way to draw attention, and I did get, you know, some funding that way. And it also made me comfortable talking solo because I was so used to, if yeah. I did it, at least have one other person, but yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, you were very, you're, you're, you were very um, casual and comfortable <laughs> and relaxed. You should feel my hands right now. They wouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> you're good. You're good. But yes, if you ever want to do one of these again, just let me know. I do schedule them about like one time a week. So just let oh, me know. Awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'd love to talk to you again. Perfect. Well, I will let you go and continue your promotion of your Kickstarter launch. And I will definitely be keeping in touch because I have probably a lot of questions about merch stuff. <laughs> Just message me anytime. You know where to find me. Perfect. Well, have a great rest of your day. And thank you for everybody who's been chiming in and listening. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.